So like we said, we're talking about human trafficking claims, which encompasses a lot of different things. Um, sex slavery, labor slavery, uh, exploited labor, people not getting paid enough money, they're working in bad conditions. Um, children are kidnapped and uh, taken away from their parents. In some cases, people are forced into slavery by uh, organized crime and gangs and um, just all sorts of manipulative processes. But, so you're probably wondering, like, all right, let's go storm the doors and take care of this. Well, there's a lot of stuff we can do uh, in the realm of life that we live in, a uh, lot of practical ways um, to take care of, to, uh, to combat these things. So the United States is such a consumer-based culture, um, society, that we have a lot of control over things based on what we buy, what we use, um, where we get things, why we get things, the sources, the people who are involved in making that. So we're going to watch a short video right now that talks a little bit more about that, and we'll come back here. What is the most lucrative illegal activity in the world? Drug and weapons trafficking. Second to this is human trafficking. Human traffickers make an estimated $32 billion a year. You might say, slavery? Didn't that end with the Civil War? No. 30 million. That's the number of slaves in the world today. I'm Courtney. I'm a singer-songwriter worship leader who learned about modern-day slavery and the even passion to put an end to it. My friend Jonathan Walton and I work with InterVarsity's New York City Urban Project to inform, engage, and inspire communities to take action. Step one, knowledge is power, and I recently realized that there are many people who know very little to nothing about modern day slavery or human trafficking. Every day, men, women, and children are tricked, kidnapped, sold, or born into slavery around the world, including in the United States. This slavery occurs in a variety of forms, including forced labor, debt bondage, sex trafficking, child labor, and child soldiering. In a world we enjoy freely, they are being acquired, held, and exploited as property and a hot commodity. This is some pretty intense information to take in, but we can take one step at a time to learn more and respond. You did not just watch this video meaninglessly. Take action with us and log off. Log off stands for local, green, organic, fair trade, and slave free. 70% of the U.S. economy is based on consumption, aka we buy stuff. So what if we were able to change our culture of constant consumption, consistent compassion, rooted in loving our neighbors? We think it would look like this. Local means getting to know your personal supply chain. It connects us to people both around the corner and around the world. For example, Globalization connects us to kids in DR Congo and China, just with the manufacturing of our cell phones. Let's get to know our neighbors. Green and organic are rooted in stewarding the relationships between our planet and its people. If every country consumed like we do in America, we would need the resources of three to five planet Earths to sustain us. Something has got to change. Fair trade and slave free are about loving the people who make the products we buy more than the products themselves. A price tag is not just a number, but a story that is too often filled with violence and coercion. It doesn't have to be this way. So what can you do now? Log off. Sign up at welogoff.com and take your place in this movement. When we launch, we'll contact you with tips, resources, and concrete next steps. We welcome you to this community committed to making daily decisions that foster freedom. So follow us on Twitter and Instagram, like us on Facebook, and stay tuned to welogoff.com because there is much more to come. Log off of what's easy and log on to what's right. Log off because we have a choice. So, it's a lot at once, a lot of big numbers, big figures and things. Um, so, you're still, you still may be wondering, like, what does the stuff we buy have to do with people who are enslaved? What does the stuff we buy have to do with people not getting fair wage? What does it have to do with people getting exploited because of their lack of education or being restricted from education? But what does the stuff, what are the stuff we buy or the things we do or the, the, the products we consume, what does it have to do with people who are um, forced into sex slavery and prostitution or um, abusive and um, uh, exploited labor? So if you turn over your sheet here to log off, like uh, she mentioned in the video, log off stands for local, green, organic, fair, and free. Um, so local, it's not just like when you're buying something. So think, let's think of a few products that we consume in the U.S. or anytime. Uh, 
a lot of ingredient, a lot of food we eat is sugar. Uh, if we look at sugar, where it comes from, in the regions of the world it comes from, is some of the most exploited uh, neurotropics and things like that. Some of the most exploited places, a lot of people working in um, conditions where they're not getting paid, they don't have laws to protect them uh, from being exploited by um, their employers or whatever. Uh, Chocolate is a big one. We all enjoy chocolate. We all enjoy cheap chocolate. Run to the vending machine and get something. Um, cocoa beans are one of the most uh, slave-related products uh, in the world right now. Um, oftentimes in uh, the west coast of Africa and other parts of Africa where cocoa beans are some of the more um, prominent crops, the kids are actually taken captive and kidnapped by um, these guys who are exploiting them, forcing them into labor. Uh, and then it gets sold really cheap to companies like Hershey's and Nestle and uh, big companies who make all that. Um, so it's about knowing where stuff comes from is a big thing. Our clothing, uh, if we, like don't turn it inside out now, but um, pretty much anything we're wearing right now, you take a look at the tag, it's going to be made in China, it's made in Indonesia. Um, Cotton comes from Uzbekistan, which is one of the most, about 70% of the world's cotton comes from Uzbekistan, uh, which some people have never even heard of, but um, the vast majority of uh, cotton that's produced in all of our clothing uh, is produced with people, by people who are not either getting paid very little or nothing, and uh, they have no escape from that because their economies have collapsed and things like that. Uh, so green initiatives, he says, contributing to green initiatives can involve small changes in daily life. Getting organic products or switching light bulbs and things. Uh, the electricity and the power we use also comes from these things, coal and uh, other resources that are, they come from sources that are um, exploited labor. Um, the same goes for organic. Fair trade is a big one, like we talked about with chocolate. And coffee is another, is another big one. Uh, I don't know about anybody, but I drink quite a bit of coffee. Um, but when you start realizing where the coffee is coming from, uh, like Starbucks for instance, and uh, Tim Hortons even, we have a Tim Hortons over on the Plot Sam's campus. Uh, they have one of the worst ratings, actually, for the fair trade sourcing of their coffee. Um, it's often harvested by uh, children who aren't legally old enough to work. And even if they were, they're not getting paid what they should. Uh, they're getting forced to get that, take it with their families in many cases uh, to do that. And slave-free uh, is along the same lines. Uh, being slave-free means to be a conscious investor. As consumers, we invest in individuals, communities, institutions with our time, money, and energy. So it's not... I'm not saying, like, we're not saying, like, oh, the clothes I'm wearing came from a, a country or uh, have been produced in a sweatshop where my sneakers, for instance, Nike, is, uh, is very prominent with his uh, well, child slave girls sweatshops. It doesn't mean you have to go take all your stuff and burn it because it was made by them. Because God's grace is bigger than all that. Uh, what it does mean is we should be more conscious of where we're spending our money. Is it a choice between getting a 50 cent thing of chocolate or a few dollars more for something that we can get that was made by people who are getting paid a fair wage? They're getting supported. They have not, they're working in safe conditions. Um, because even in the United States, where a lot of this is prominent with sex trafficking, um, our labor has a lot of laws to protect us from that. But illegal immigrants, for instance, um, who are, are undocumented workers, I should say, um, get brought over the border and they are paid minimum wage, or uh, minimally or nothing uh, because they can slip under the radar, the companies can, and they will um, be exploited. But then we get cheap vegetables and cheap uh, produce and things like that because the companies we're buying from are willing to do that. So the only way we can really change that, they won't okay, sell guys, it if we don't buy if it. you could so. please move.
So Derek, can you tell me um, your character, your person, and how are you doing so far? Can you explain this to Extremely us? Extremely bad. Um, <clears throat> st- 
story storyline is story D. So okay. you got a one. This is the story that all the ones would have. Okay. Um, it says I was born female in the Northeast United States. It's, education is not a priority in my area, especially for women. You were not given an opportunity to go to school. Living where you do changes the effect of the one-child policy on your family. Your parents are allowed two children, but your older brother is expected to take over the family farm after your father. And that's all we've got so far. I've got three more tables to go, I think, so. It's looking pretty bad so far. We'll check back later. Thank you. At this station, we are writing letters to women who have been rescued from sex slavery by something called the Nomi Network. The Nomi Network is based out of New York City, and they rescue women from slavery and teach them how to sew and give them a place to sell the things they make so that they have a livelihood and are less economically vulnerable to be trafficked again. Um, it also supports them and helps them recover. And we're writing letters of hope, encouragement, and love just to give them something to encourage them. I'm sure they do. Uh, actually, if you want more information, they have a website, nomi-network.org. Um, it's a really good resource if you want to learn more about this. So, we have cards here, pens, colored pencils. If you can't think of anything to say right now, um, there will be time after the stations and the presentation, so you can come back and finish them or give them to me later. Just find it. Um, yes, we do know that it will be women receiving these okay. because that's who the Nomi Network works with. But we don't know who individually will be getting them. So. Some people have been um, Or is it usually? The, I'm sure there's a range of ages. The average age for getting into sex slavery is 12 to 14. So they'll be pretty young. I'm sure some of them will be pretty young. You can take these with you, the link is on there. So you just circle the option and then we'll give you the numbers at the end. Station? No, we're going to be live. Okay. Cool. So then, like, you help us fill this rest of this stuff? Um, yeah, like, I'll read the kind of answer key. Is everybody's done? Is everybody all set? Um, so, on that top line, um, you're going to write 13. And that's, you know, assuming that you live in a house or a dorm. Um, so if you own a car, you would write seven, and if you don't, then you wouldn't add any. So if you wear makeup, that's four. So for electronics, the minimum is two. The average option is four. 
and the nerd is nine. You can also shop there and buy the things that And then for sports, you know, the little like minimum option is one. Um, pretty sporty is two, and then the jocks is five. And then for clothes, um, very few would be six. Average is ten, and then diva is fifteen. So you would add all those numbers up for your total. Um, again, this is a really rough estimate. That link on the bottom, um, you can take a much more thorough quiz. It'll go into food, um, and you can like specify a lot of things. Um, and if you guys are having a really hard time hearing this, um, talk to one of us. You know, we don't we don't want you to go away feeling guilty and depressed. Like we we want to help you. Um, and you've already been to the log off table. That'll tell you you know what you can do. Um, like, you know, there's little things that you can do that make a pretty big difference. Okay, so to give you a brief back view. I was born in the Northeast in the United States, female. Education is a isn't a priority, so I didn't go to school. Living where I do changes the effect of the one child policy. My family's allowed to have two children, but my older brothers expect to take over the farm. Remember, I'm a girl. So, my family lives in the rural, rural area. Poor area, but not destitute. The only work is in farming, and there aren't enough jobs in that. So due to the lack of jobs, young people from my village often leave to find work in the cities. So currently, I'm guessing I'm en route to one of the cities, and yeah, it's going to turn bad from there. ...is marked by hypersexuality. And I'm here to tell you that there is just a place for you. If you just toss your standards of conduct and moral fibers outside the window panes because we, the people, establish and amend the rules of this game. And in this game, I choose to use women as the tools instrumental to the accumulation of my wealth and my fame. I am just one of numerous individuals or numerous persons interested in making people serviceable. Now, they refer to us as pimps. And it's a title I've worked hard to obtain and of which I am proud to maintain. See, we revel in seeing the number of lives we've turned upside down. And the great part of it all, because there are no moral standards, you can't tell which side's the upside now. But I digress. I'm here to share with you some stats of which I know you'll be impressed and I know you'll find it so difficult to digest because it's just so great. But before I get to that, let me introduce myself. My name is Sex Trap Icking. It's hyphenated. And to my credit, I am a major shareholder in one of the world's largest criminal organizations. So I listen close because it is high time to invest. Now, I remember when I was younger, so poor, but rich with big hopes and big dreams. But I knew I wouldn't make it even if I tried my best. And try I did. I studied hard. I worked hard in school. So keep at it, kids, until one day when I was home alone, as I usually was, I found a book. It was my first encounter with the sex industry. And for seven years I was hooked. I read it, I listened to it, I stole it, I watched it, until finally it hit me. It dawned on me, like an epiphany. I realized if I want to make money, if I want to make something of myself, I need to sell a product. But not just any product. This is where it gets interesting. Track with me. Not just any product, but the kind of product that will produce a profit continuously over an extended period of time. Sounds impossible, I know, but listen, guns don't last. Drugs burn out. But a woman, if I can make her into a shelf product, will return a profit, not 10, not 50, but 100% of the time. Won't cost you a dime. The real crime would be to ignore such a lucrative opportunity. So here's what I'm gonna do for you lovely folks today. I am going to share with you three keys to my success. It's gonna come at you fast, so get your mental notes ready because I know that we're a technologically advanced, you know, culture, so we don't really use pen and paper anymore. So get ready, here we go, three keys to my success. Are you ready for this? First key, first key, think of women as potentially profitable objects. This business is cutthroat. You gotta be ready to step over anyone who erects themselves against you. Second key, don't be afraid to take advantage. You have to project your authority. One will lose all sense of dignity, all sense of hope, and all sense of self-respect. So you have to be ready to take advantage when you see these traits becoming increasingly manifest. Key number three, 
In our society, in our culture, in our country, we have a severe lack of aftercare facilities. So if any of your employees get away, don't worry about it. They're most likely returned to the streets. So be ready, okay, to welcome them back and take advantage of their post-traumatic nightmares and distress. Use that in your favor. Now listen, this right here, what I'm about to get to, is where most of our persons interested in making people serviceable, pimps, you'll catch on. This is where they fall short. This is where they mess up. This is where they don't make it, okay? Just because we're the third largest organization behind guns and drugs doesn't mean there's no competition. Now, to ward off some of those people who would try to steal our customers, we try to maintain a few principles. Three principles I'm gonna share with you. The first principle, ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. No one can compete against us if no one is actively aware that we exist. Principle number two, looks are everything. Make the business look good. Produce movies like Pretty Woman. You'll be surprised how many of them enlist. Principle number three, and this one's very important because it attacks the very essence of our establishment, the very core of our organization, okay? Beware of sincere, Jesus-loving Christians. Now, I'll tell you why. When a woman escapes or is rescued, or as we like to put it, stops doing business with persons interested in making people serviceable pimps, we'll catch on. When they stop doing business with us, there's no place inside herself for peace to reside. And that's because we have successfully destroyed the very core of what she believes in. We have successfully stripped away everything that made her who she was and withered away and died. But the Christian, okay, the Christian maintains that in Jesus Christ is the hope of full restoration and the newness of their lives. Now listen, listen very closely, okay? Apart from this kind of hope that Christians offer, that they say is in Jesus Christ, there is no possible hope that can, that can transform you from the inside out. It's an impossible thing to find. Now, I'll leave you with this, okay folks? Pimps, like myself, sex trafficking, Gun trafficking, drug trafficking, child trafficking, and on and on and on. We exist. We are alive. We are thriving, okay? And we propose to deprive the of the most basic and sustainable rights so that we can destroy them to kill them in such a way that they are made financially responsible to us. And this is effective. We are efficient and we are wise friends. Now, the best part of it is there is no standard of conduct. Let's go. Is there is no standard of right and wrong. I'm not sure if we're all traffickers or all slaves. Actually, there's some traffickers, some slaves. I think it should be made to be my beginning. Excuse me, we need to represent the 27 million uh, slaves, approximately, that we're talking about tonight. Um, you've been uh, like taken right out of the middle of your stations um, because when people are trafficked and brought into slavery, they're not being asked, they're just being whisked away, um, separated from the people that they care about and doing things that they want to do, put in uncomfortable situations. Um, so in a little bit, um, once everyone else is done with the stations, um, we're going to lead you um, in there and you guys are going to actually be sitting in the seven seats that are for roped off in the front um, as sort of an exercise to sit in this um, so that maybe you can get a small piece of what the people that are trapped have to do.
for years, I wondered how I would react to a crisis. I wondered how I might respond in an extreme need. Would I snap into action? Would I become a hero? Would strength and determination course with the adrenaline through my veins, or would I be paralyzed and hysterical? Would fear overwhelm me and my own self-doubt convince me to flee the scene, protecting only myself and leaving someone in need? How would I react in a crisis? Well, my answer came two years ago. It was a warm, sunny day, the perfect kind of day to take the family to the lake for a swim. It was this kind of day that I had envisioned when I had taken this lifeguarding job. Everything was going well as I began my shift in the chair. The water was busy, but it wasn't too crowded, and everybody seemed to be having a good time, and nobody was roughhousing, so I wasn't concerned. And then I saw him. In my estimation, he couldn't have been more than, than three years old, I would say. His mother, engrossed in conversation with a friend, had waded out into shoulder-deep water and left her son, who was content at the time, to play on the sand but he wasn't content anymore, and he was crying out to her, and she wasn't listening. So he got up and started to walk out to his mother. Do you see where this is going? You and I would know that he would drown long before he reached his mother, and she didn't hear him. So he kept crying and crying and walking further and further, and he wasn't being responded to. I was on the edge of my seat. I was panicking. Surely, she'll hear her son, I thought to myself. Surely, any minute now, she's gonna realize that he's crying and they'll go back to playing on the sand and this will go back to being a picture perfect sunny day. But that never happened. And then, it happened. The moment I dreaded, the moment that I prayed, wouldn't happen. The boy took that critical step that turned that perfect summer's day into a downright nightmare. He couldn't stand anymore. He was drowning. Confused and helpless, I watched this little boy sink under the water, and then I snapped to action. I didn't need to think. My whistle sounded to me, and I ran across the sand and whisked up the boy in my arms and ran onto the beach before I could even think about what I had done or before his mother would bother to turn around. Challenge accepted. Crisis averted. So how about you? Like me? Do you wonder how you'd respond in a crisis? If you came across someone who needed your help, someone who was helpless to change their current circumstances, caught quite literally in a life or death situation, what would you do? Rather, what will you do? Because this certainly is the case. The question is not whether or not people are in crisis. The question is whether you know enough to respond, whether your heart is broken enough to respond. As we speak, there are 27 million slaves caught in human trafficking. Sex slaves, labor slaves, child soldiers, those born into slavery, tricked into slavery, sold into slavery, people who are coerced, threatened, abused, and forced to work against their will. <coughs> As we speak, there are 200,000 slaves in the United States. Attorneys from the US Department of Justice have prosecuted slave trade activity in 91 cities in almost every state in the country. This year, another 17,000 
500 people will be trafficked into the US. This year, the International Labor Office estimates that the commerce of humans will generate about $32 billion. That's comparable to Coca-Cola's annual revenue. That's comparable to the annual revenue of the US's pharmaceutical industry, or the wedding industry, or the tobacco industry. And as we learned, as we went around these stations, we perpetuate the exploitation of human beings by buying clothes from sweatshops and food from plantations that exploit their laborers. As we see, there are 27 people here in the front tonight who represent 27 million slaves in the world today. Take a look at these people right now and multiply that by a million. We are in the midst of a real crisis. So how are you going to react? How are you going to respond? I was first confronted with these statistics about three years ago when I was at a conference in St. Louis, Missouri. And I responded with anger and with horror and with shock. How can slavery, a practice I was sure was put to death with the Emancipation Proclamation proclamation still persist in the world today? And how can I think myself well informed and know nothing about the slaves that made my clothes or the slaves that mined the silver in my jewelry? And if millions of women are forced to prostitute themselves, what good fortune gives me dignity and makes me free? Something in me snapped. Anger turned to conviction, and shock changed to compassion. I was so burdened by this information and so moved by the stories that I had heard that I wanted to do something. My circumstances, my upbringing, my family experiences, and my education have prevented me from being trafficked. But there are girls in other countries who are just like me, who aren't so lucky. And I don't know why, but somehow I feel this strange solidarity with them. My hands are free, and so I want to extend them to reach those whose hands are bound. Like the Bible says, I want to use my freedom to loose the chains of injustice. I love reading the Bible. <laughs> it's stories fascinate me, its teaching convicts me, and I'm convinced that the Bible is truly God's word because I have never read a book that is so raw and genuine and real. The Bible covers the spectrum of human emotions, positions, and circumstances, from animosity to love to despair, from kings to commoners to slaves. Yes. The Bible talks about slavery. And because the Bible does talk about slavery, we get a glimpse at the heart of the God who would, <laughs> just, his heart just breaks about slavery. In the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible contains the story of Joseph, a young man who was sold into slavery by his own brothers. See. Joseph was his father's favorite son, and his brothers just hated him for it. They didn't hide it in the way they treated him, in the way they talked about him. Joseph's brothers were shepherds, and so they were out in the fields one day, and he went to go check on them. And when his brothers saw him coming, they debated among themselves whether or not they should kill their own brother. They decided, however, to sell him into slavery so that they could be rid of him and be a little bit richer. Can you imagine a hatred, a grudge, a loathing that goes so deep that you would hand your own brother over to captors? It's gritty, isn't it? It's kind of like the world today. But the Bible says that God is close to the brokenhearted. God sees injustice, and he's aware of our pain. And as we see in Joseph's story, God shows up 
in the most unlikely places. This is more than making the best out of a bad situation. Only God can take a horrible evil like slavery and truly transform it into something good. So the story goes on. While Joseph was enslaved, God gave him the ability to interpret dreams. And he had the ability to interpret one of the king's dreams, and from that dream he predicted a famine that would befall the land. And he saved an entire country from dying of starvation, and for that the king appointed him to be his right-hand man. God took Joseph, a slave, a prisoner, and exalted him to power and restored his dignity. Just as God was close to Joseph as he was enslaved, God is close to those 27 million men, women, and children enslaved today. God can transform any situation. We're still seeing it today. Women who were sold into sex slavery have been rescued and are now working tirelessly to free women who are in brothels. And organizations like the International Justice Mission are putting the pressure on law enforcement agencies to uphold the freedom of their citizens. And yes, even traffickers are turning from careers of buying and selling people. And they're heeding the call to respect people. God can transform any situation. God is close to the brokenhearted. The Bible also said, says that God hears the cry of the oppressed, and answers their petitions for justice. But if that's true, then why are there still 27 million slaves in the world today? If God hears their cries, then why isn't he doing something about it? I don't know. I don't know. The Bible says that our knowledge is incomplete, and our ability even to talk about God is incomplete. So I don't know. But I do know one thing. I know that God in his infinite love sent his son Jesus on a rescue mission to free us all from the slavery to sin. Jesus, the very son of God, became man and lived among us. And Jesus showed us what it means to love and how it looks like to treat every human being with dignity. And what did he get in return for that? He was misunderstood and he was mistreated, he was beaten, he was tortured, he was stripped, he was spit on, he was deprived of every ounce of dignity, and then he was killed. Jesus knows what sorrow means, and he knows what abuse feels like. He knows what it feels like to be dehumanized. But the story doesn't end there. Jesus rose from the dead and conquered that very sin, that very sickness that caused people to mistreat him in the first place. Jesus demonstrated God's love for the brokenhearted in a physical, practical way. Jesus loves us so much that he literally came near to, lived alongside those who were downcast and hurting. Jesus also demonstrated God's heart for justice. Jesus advocated for the lowest of the low. In Jesus, all of our failures and faults, the ill will we harbor, the evil we're capable of, they're taken away and we're considered blameless before God. And one day, every person will stand before Jesus and give an account for their actions. That means you and me. And yes, that means the traffickers and the slave holders. So, God is close to the brokenhearted. God hears the cries of the oppressed and answers their petitions for justice. The Bible also says that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So how well do we know God? How well do we know his heart? How deep is our relationship with him? Are we burdened by the things that burden him? Do we weep with him over the 27 million slaves in the world today? Once we've given Jesus control of our lives, then our prayers are powerful and effective. Once we have a relationship with God, then we have the amazing privilege to partner with him in setting the captives free. 
like God, sent his son Jesus on a rescue mission to set us free from sin, he's got a plan for each and every one of us to free those in slavery in his name. So maybe you've never looked into God's heart for injustice before. The Bible is filled with passages dealing with injustice and oppression. There are literally thousands of verses on the issue because it's a big deal to God. Or maybe you don't consider yourself a religious person, but you're compelled to advocate for the 27 million all the same. Let me say, we should let our common passions bring us together. So let's talk about how we can end slavery together. Together, our voice will be louder, our hands will reach farther, and our passions will burn stronger. Like Isaiah, that ancient prophet, let us boldly declare the spirit of the Lord is on me to pro proclaim good news to the poor, to preach liberty to captives, and release from darkness for prisoners. So, if you've ever wondered how you'd respond in a crisis, <clears throat> ask yourself this important question. How will you respond to the crisis of human trafficking? All of us wonder how we would have acted in the epic struggles of human history. Would we have hidden a Jewish family in our attic during the Nazi regime? Would we have opened our home to escape slaves as a place of refuge on the Underground Railroad? Well, there's a time to read history, and there's a time to make history. There's a time to read history, and there's a time to make history. We are amid an epic struggle in human history. So how will you respond? Make no mistake about it, God is close to the brokenhearted. God hears the cries of the oppressed and answers their petitions for justice. And the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And a day is coming when every slave will be free and every captor will stand condemned. So let's make the choice tonight to build a closer relationship with the God of justice and mercy. Let's commit ourselves tonight to partnering with Jesus and setting the captives free. If you've never made a commitment to Jesus before, and you're interested in knowing more, I would love to meet you and have the chance to talk to you. And please, continue to talk about what you've experienced tonight. Let's continue to have our hearts broken for the brokenhearted. Let's brainstorm ways we can respond. And as we read, the thousands of scriptures about injustice, let's be moved to pray with all of our heart because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And as we pray with all of our heart, let us also pray with our hands and our feet. Let our prayers change the way we spend our money to invest in people's freedom and not their exploitation. Let our prayers move us to reach out to victims of human trafficking by writing letters and notes of encouragement. Let our prayers even move our feet to actively set the captives free if God calls us to do so. Would you pray with me? Lord God, Jesus, in you we have a perfect picture of love. God, if we want to know what justice looks like, all we have to do is look to you. God, we thank you that you do not stand far off and you're not unaware of the 27 million slaves in the world today. We pray, Lord, that we would no longer be far off from those who are hurting, that we would no longer be unaware of those who are in bondage. Lord, we pray that you would show us your will for us. You would show us how we should act. And God, that we would have the privilege in knowing you 
and in partnering with you to bring in liberty to the captives. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, I would like to invite up <laughs> the cover band now and Rachel, who will be performing for us. It was the year the crows and the locusts came, the fields drained dry the rain, the fields are bleeding.
my name is Matt, and I'm the president of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, who hosted this event. Um, I want to take this chance to thank you all for coming. Um, Beard, since you're close, can you get the comment cards and the pencils and start passing them out? Um, we'd like your feedback um, on how this event went um, so that we can <coughs> make changes accordingly in future Friday Night Lives. Um, so now's the time. People should be passing out cards and pencils um, and see if you can give that feedback to us. Um, when you're done filling out the cards, pass them to the center or up here and I'll collect them. <laughs> 